Hello, everybody. My name is Sridhar Mupiri. I'm the CTO for IBM Security. In my role, I have the privilege to provide architecture guidance and drive the research for IBM Security Division. Today, I'm going to talk about how AI is influencing the world of cybersecurity and how do we use cybersecurity to not only defend our organizations, but also to protect the AI that the organizations are going to be uh, developing. Given the recent news and cybersecurity incidents, everybody knows the importance of uh, you know, cybersecurity and how attackers are using some of the um, state-of-the-art technology to be able to launch devastating impact. It's not like you know we are looking at AI ourselves, but our adversaries, the attackers, are also looking at AI. So we're going to look at both sides of the equation in this session. So at IBM, we look at AI for cybersecurity in multiple dimensions. First, we look at how attackers are using AI to launch attacks. And then we also look at how defenders are using AI to fight against these attacks. And then the, the next dimension of it is, to, which is, as most of the organizations are developing AI, this AI itself is susceptible for attacks. It's called adversarial AI. And that AI needs to be defended as well, right? Which is what countering the adversarial AI is. So in a typical organization, Within, if if you're if you're joining from a specific organization, whether you're a partner or you're a client, we have to look at it from a couple of dimensions. First is how do you protect the organization from these AI attacks? Second is how do you protect the organization with AI? And then third is how do you protect your organization's AI? So we're going to talk about those three aspects of. AI and cybersecurity today. Now I'm going to go a little bit fast over here just to give you a, a context, but attackers are using AI fairly ubiquitously, right? Um, if you look at some of the attack mechanisms over here, they're looking at in terms of how do you provide a, a way to evade the malware detection or to be able to um, exploit specific vulnerabilities of the software and be able to you know, provide reconnaissance or, or channels to um, exfiltrate data or steal data. Attackers are also making the attack very adaptive, right? Being able to start somewhere and, and watch and learn the behavior of the system and then be able to go expand the attack. If you look at a very simple um, pattern, it's not really simple, but if you if you look at a pattern, you now here's a mechanism by which an adversary on the left hand side is able to craft an email to bypass you know most of the filters and and do some level of you know, phishing or sphere phishing, right? And once you do that, um, you're able to then go install some malware which is able to bypass the traditional endpoint detection systems or antivirus systems so that it is now sitting not only in your system but also within your environment trying to learn the traffic learn, learn the behaviors and looking for potentially vulnerable spots and then once you find that you're able to um, use ai to be able to create some uh, attacks using some creative patterns and some of the research over here, I, I will pull this together so that it's important to understand how attackers are using AI so that we can do a better job of defending against that. At IBM, we do spend a quite a bit of time on this topic as well. 
we developed something called Deep Locker and shared it at Black Hat in 2018. Um, and the idea over here is to basically take a, a benign application like your Word or, or Slack or any of these application and use an existing malware, which may also be benign, uh, but infuse some artificial intelligence into that so that for any evading system, it may seem benign. But at the back end, you can see on the bottom right, it can launch a, a number of different patterns of attack just to understand how attackers are using this. We spend a lot of time on using AI for launching attacks as well so that we can do a better job of defending against those. And all of this material is, is published in the URL. So um, I urge you to take a look at some of these things just to get an appreciation of how the attack attackers are using AI. Now, the important part of the discussion is how do you protect the organization with AI, right? This is where most of our time goes, and this is where most of our time we should be spending. Now, if you look at our security environment, right? And if you look at any framework, um, let's take, for example, NIST. We are in the business of protecting, detecting, and responding. Of course, you know there's identification and recover on other sides. Um, but simply, simply speaking, we we provide a mechanisms to protect, detect, and respond. And when bad things happen, be able to recover. But the reality is, given the security landscape, there's too many products that leads to too much of complexity. As a result we've got a lot of data that we have to deal with. And the challenge is that we have too few skills and too little time. This is where AI comes to our help. You combine the speed of AI and the accuracy of AI with the human creativity and ingenuity, that's when really good things happen. Like increasing the proactiveness being able to improve the accuracy of detection. Otherwise, what happens is you're playing whack-a-mole, right? Every alert comes up, you're chasing after that, but instead using AI to increase the accuracy so you're spending time on the right alerts. And then be able to respond faster. Today, an average attack takes about 220 days to detect, another 80 days to respond. That's a lot of time. AI can be used to bring that window to a smaller time frame, so that you can respond faster, thereby reducing the overall cost of your program. So what do we do specifically, right? Um, when we talk about proactive protection, this is about understanding what are your high value assets? What is your high, high value um, crown jewels, or what is the, what is the, you know, the mechanism to determine risk so that you can focus on the, on the right assets or be able to address the right level of risk for the organization. That's when we use AI to basically say, discover the data, not just structured, but also unstructured because there's a lot of unstructured data these days which is on-prem, off-prem, in cloud, in SaaS. So you have to use techniques like natural language processing to be able to go and not only discover, but be able to classify this data. Once you classify, you can then provide the appropriate risk scoring. This also is not an absolute number, right? It's a question of understanding the business context, understanding threat, the vulnerability, the weaponization, how susceptible is a specific vulnerability for attack. These things have to be put together in a multi-dimensional manner to be able to calculate the risk, which is specific to each of the organization. So now you have your crown jewels, you have the classifications, you have the risk. You can then go ahead and put policies to say, how do I provide least privileged policies? How do I make sure that I can then do continuous verification on certain 
assets? How do I safeguard privileged activity? And you can see, you know, things like natural language processing or risk scoring or some of the being able to detect that drift for policy and correcting that. That's where AI can be used. Now, if you go to the next section, right, assuming that you've done everything, hopefully nothing bad happens. But if something does happen, then we need to be able to not only quickly detect it, but detect it accurately, right? And the way you do that is to be able to, first and foremost, look at the anomaly activity. Not just anomalies of attack parameters, like what we call indicators of compromise, but indicators of behavior as well, right? It's, it's one thing to understand that a specific IP address, which is potentially a bad, um, can easily be found and, and figure out if your organization has the same IP address and take corrective actions. In another thing to look at behavior right now, right? Um, I see that the network traffic is a larger or uh, a lot more than what it's used to seeing. I see a lot more um, failed authentications, right? I see some a lot of this data activity going through this port that I usually don't see. Those are the behaviors that you have to look at as well and, and be able to look at a, a way to not just do anomaly detection, but also continuous um, detection across a, a number of different um, data sets to be able to pinpoint the accuracy of the detection. The other aspect is also making it relevant for your organization. You may have an attack brewing up, but may not be specific to your organization. For example, there may be a vulnerability in a point of sale system, but you are a financial organization that usually doesn't deal with the point of sale system, right? Or you may have a specific you know, indicator of compromise, but you've patched the system, right? So it may be less immediate for you versus in other situations where you may have a potential vulnerability and the machine learning tells us that it is very easy for attackers to leverage that vulnerability. That's where you want to prioritize that. And the last but not the least is the acceleration of the um, attack or, or the investigation of the um, attack and, and remediating or, or responding to that. Once you determine that it is an attack that needs to be investigated, you want to base, bring that investigation time as, you know, as, as small as possible. Like I said before, right? it takes almost 220 days to detect and another 80 days to respond, and, and you want to bring that down. And the way you do that is to be able to use machine learning to do automatic threat disposition. right? How do you know that attack is real or unreal? Based on historical data, we can use machine learning as a way to provide a level of accuracy saying that, you know, with 90% confidence, we can say that this is an attack, so you should focus on that, right? How do you provide a mechanism to bubble up the high priority alerts so that your SOC analyst is looking at things that matter for the day versus looking at each and everything? This is where we have to use you know, training data to train the models. But then again, when you put that into production, it learns on the job because as, 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 as you continue to evolve, as you're making decisions, you continue to train the model. You have to basically rely on some of the techniques like graph analytics to be able to do reasoning to say, hey, I see this, what do you think, right? Or graph analytics, graph analytics to say, I see this in my environment, what is happening in the rest of the world and be able to find the correlations to see if there's something that we should be worried about. So as you can see, fairly wide use of AI from natural language processing to anomaly detection to you know, phishing detection to decision-making process to even recommendations, right? Um, recommendations is where you're basically saying that 
I determine that this is a potential attack. You know, I find that I see a, a large amount of network traffic coming from a specific laptop. It may be a potential risky user, but you could send a push notification to the user who owns a system. If they actually respond, they may be working on that late night, or it may be a, a bot that has been downloaded and, and doing some automatic transaction, in which case you can shut it down. At IBM, we are very, very fortunate to work with a number of data scientists and machine learning experts to pull together a, a number of models to help our portfolio. If you look at threat management and risk management, we use AI for risk assessment that we've talked about. We use AI for threat hunting, being able to go down the hypothesis of a potential issue and be able to investigate. And typically what ends up happening is you get a large amount of data. Apply AI in that to be able to narrow it down and potentially pinpoint the attack and, and be able to potentially stop and become more proactive in the approach. The second aspect is the detection part, right? This is where we're using things like anomaly detection, behavioral analytics, right? I see this user coming in every day from 8 a.m. and ends up leaving at you know, 5 p.m. But I, I see a lot of traffic coming in at you know, 6 a.m. in the morning and a lot more than what we've seen before. So you're looking at not just the anomaly detection, but also behavioral analytics and entry analytics to be able to understand a potential risky user. The similar sort of philosophy applies to a potentially an attacker sitting in a network and, and sending packets out to um, a reconnaissance server, right? Uh, beaconing is the term that we use, right? So as we look at that, the slow and steady mechanism for exfiltration of data can be detected with AI so that you can go and, and potentially investigate that. It's hard to do that through human eye. It, think, about, think about it as a potential attacker um, in a real life who is stealing you know, two cents from a bank account or all the accounts on a regular basis. It's very difficult to track it. But when you use AI and you see the pattern repeat on a regular basis, you know something is not right. That's exactly what you can do with the beaconing aspect. And then once you have something of interest, you want to respond quickly. We talked about it, right? This is where we can use AI for automatically creating that threat investigation based on machine learning models to not just provide a level of scoring on, on on the threat, but also be able to collect all the information associated with that and create an attack graph that you see on the bottom right, bottom on the top right, so that it you can it can help you accelerate that investigation. And then at the bottom you see how you can respond quickly through automated playbooks. Now AI is not just to detect the bad entities, right, or the bad events. It's also used to provide um, good experience to our consumers. What I call it, letting the good guys in. The previous page was keeping the bad guys out. In this case, again, you want to use AI like natural language processing for classifying data so that you can go ahead and put the right level of controls and, and protect right from the get go. Right, and not just at the data level, but also at the flow level, as how the data is flowing, so that you can then go and put the right policies to say, you know, you can send the data from this computer to the next computer, but not to the third computer, right? You can put some very specific um, policies based on detecting the, the flow um, and analyzing that. When you monitor, 
activities, whether you're monitoring authentication, when you're monitoring data, typically you want to look for outlier detection, right? Um, here's a teller of a bank looking at a consumer database and, and potentially doing a, a SQL query on that. Not necessarily the right normal behavior. That would consider as an outlier detection, right? Um, that's a simple outlier detection that you can you can go and and look at some transactions which are not right. On the other hand, you can also learn the transaction, something called predictive analytics using some neural network and deep learning, um, something called as LSTM, uh, long term short term memory, where let's say you're transferring money from one account to a different account. Typically, you've got a debit, a credit, a get balance, a um, couple of times just to make sure things are done right. So you, you get the balance, you debit from one account, you credit another account. Um, so if you miss any of the steps, you can go and, and figure out you know, where the issue is and stop that transaction midstream. That's what predictive analytics could, could help us with. The other one which is really powerful and very useful is the behavioral biometrics. You know, typically consumers don't like a lot of friction when you're accessing websites. You don't want to enter a long password followed by a two-factor authentication and another two-factor authentication for every transaction, right? You want to be able to silently collect a lot of information behind the scenes so that you can keep the experience very, very frictionless. That's where behavioral biometrics can come in, where you're looking at the keystrokes of how you use your keyboard, right? Um, how you use your mouse or how you use a mobile device. Bring all of these things together so that you can create a heat map and say, even though this is, you know, if I'm coming from my own system, my own laptop, and everything matches, let's not try to give the user more friction. On the other hand, it may be my system, but somebody's borrowed it and somebody's trying to do something malicious with it. You may want to stop it with an additional level of validation or verification or two-factor or multi-factor authentication. That way, you're not penalizing everybody, but penalizing only the situations where something bad happens and thus keeping the friction to very low. AI can also be used for some mundane tasks like risk-based certification, right? This is a typical, most of your managers may, may experience this, right? You wanna be able to provide access to an employee for a specific system for, for the next six months and certify that. What's in, what ends up happening is because you have so many certifications, people don't tend to look into the details. This is where we can use AI as a mechanism to provide a level of risk to say, hey, this user is asking for this highly sensitive data store, but in the last six months, they've never accessed it, or they have too many violations, or their peers don't have the same access. Based on that, you can provide a level of scoring mechanisms. And in some cases, you can take a low risk transaction or low risk certification and approve it automatically. And just keeping the manager time to approve and focus on the high risk certifications. Hopefully this gives some examples of you know, how we use AI within a portfolio. Now let me let me end uh, with this last example <clears throat> of using AI for cyber fraud. In the top of the picture, you see attackers are using different techniques at different stages of the attack. Right? If you look at it from a hacker perspective, you're getting credentials, right? Whether it's credential stuffing or social engineering or through malware or phishing attacks, you're able to you know, compromise credentials and use those credentials or be able to use sentiment analysis to log in, right? Once you log in, getting access system, you're doing 
reconnaissance through some proxy or through existing protocol, um, and then steal the data and monetize it. Think of the top one as the attack lifecycle of how an attacker thinks. As you can tell, there's no one technique that attackers use. There's more than one technique that they're using to break through, right? In, there's, a, there's a myth which basically talks about attackers having to get it right just once and the defenders having to get it right all the time. That is a myth, right? Attackers are also have to get it right all the time. They have to use different techniques. They're using AI, they're using ML. If one technique doesn't work, the different techniques have to use. Sometimes it's a combination of things that have to come together so that that yields results for them. As a result, we have to think the same way. We have to think about not just one way of addressing the problem, but maybe more than one way. For example, at the bottom of the picture, you see that, right? How as you look at preventing a um, attacks during um, onboarding or, or creating fictitious accounts through bots, you have to use more than one mechanism, right? Mechanisms that will provide you of how you're looking at the hardware, looking at the software, looking at the behavior, um, looking at some of the, uh, the, the details of the connections, right? All of that have to be come together to ensure that it's, it's a bot or not a bot, or a human or not a human, right? And, and let's say you get past that, we have to look at multiple ways of detecting phishing. It's not just like you know, looking at the URL um, or the domain name per se, but in some cases you have to look at the, the forms, um, some of the image, some of the URLs, um, some of the you know specific HTML content. Um, as you look at that and you analyze that in more than one ways, that's when you have a chance of potentially stopping an attack. Just like what we talked about before, when we talked about behavioral biometrics, you're not using one technique per se, but you're using a combination of your keystrokes or your mouse movement. And if you're on a mobile device, how do you touch and how do you swipe and how do you send? and bringing those things together so that you can now create a, a risk scoring mechanism to say, this is a potentially high risk transaction, hence, let me apply some friction, if not, let them go through. So let me come to the, the last part of the, the discussion, right? <clears throat> so we talked about, number one, how do the attackers use AI? Number two, how can we use AI to protect our organization? This is the third part. Most of you in your organizations are working with your line of business that is creating AI, AI for consumer buying patterns, AI for being able to provide better customer service, um, being able to do a better job of delivering insurance quotes or providing healthcare services or consumer goods your organizations are growing and transforming with AI. Guess what? This AI is susceptible for attacks too, right? We talked about AI powered attacks earlier in the presentation. If you, if you focus on the, in the middle column, this is where the AI itself can be attacked by attacking the data that is used to train it. You know, things like poisoning, right? Things like bias. If you use the wrong type of um, data, it could result in incorrect things, incorrect results. I, I kept an example over here just to give a level of appreciation, right? Where this is a chat bot at the very top, um, Microsoft Daybot, which was trained with uh, Twitter feeds and, and you know, as you send more and more tweets, it's learning. And guess what? When you start sending bad tweets, it is starting to learn the bad things. And as a result, it was using some level of um, racial slurs and responses. At the bottom of the picture, or the bottom of the, you know, the middle column, you see two pictures, right? 
Um, the one on the left is an actress, and the one on, on the on the right with the glasses is a mathematician from Stanford, right? Abhishek Shets. That's an attack where by wearing a simple pair of glasses like what you see, you can you can hit upon some blind spots. You can hit up some blind spots to think the and fool the model into thinking about a, another person altogether. And I'll show you that in, in a different um, form factor, not just images, but also videos, as well as text. The third type of attack is stealing the model itself. You know, the, your crown jewels that you talk about as your own AI to go and provide a, you know, a, a, a a mechanism to provide an insurance quotes as an example. That model itself could be stolen. Think about it as 20 questions. For those of you um, who don't know, um, it's a game that you usually play with um, kids where you're thinking about a person or a thing or an event, and you know you're you're guessing through through yes and no questions, right? Is it a person? Um, is is it a male or a female? Is it an actress or a politician? And you ask the questions, and you reduce, and and you deduce that there's potentially what you're thinking about. Of course, the game is only twenty questions, but attackers don't have the limit of twenty questions, so they can use API to ask the questions over and over and again to be able to steal the model, and that's what you see on the bottom right, right? The picture on the right-hand side is a real person. By questioning the model over and over and over again, they were able to come back and reconstruct that face, um, which is a little bit distorted. But you can tell that it's fairly close enough that it can pass a, you know, a facial recognition program. Just to give a level of example, right? You know, here's here's a, a sentiment analysis of a um a movie as an example right you can see something um like this by changing a few words here and there you can go from thumbs down to thumbs up right um and these are very difficult to detect in english you can see that when i when i point out you know the three red words you know what has been introduced on the other hand if you look at videos Right, like this is the video on the left-hand side um, of what you're seeing, and the right-hand side is what the computer is seeing, the LiDAR system is seeing. By introducing a small distortion, right, and you can't see through the naked eye on the left-hand side, it looks exactly like the, the video on the top left. But for the computer, you can see that it's a totally different image as the reading. This is how you can fool a system into thinking that a stop sign could be a yield sign or a 30 mile speed limit and, and be able to cause some devastating impact. This is all the research that um, we do as a mechanism to protect it. So how do we protect it? We protect it in three ways, right? First is being able to provide a, a mechanism to um, give a level of fairness in, in the model, right? You want to make sure that there's no bias. Um, there's no bias of, you know, race, bias of gender, bias of data, bias of thinking, right? Um, about a year ago, I think there was a, a model which was broken um, because I think the pe the people who worked on it all came from the same geo location from the same country. So the attackers were able to grasp how the model could have been created based on their um, social patterns. So you need to think about in a, a mechanism of how do you detect that fairness. So we created a, a toolkit for detecting the fairness. We've got more than 70 plus fairness models and metrics that we introduced over here, um, different types of bias mitigation mechanisms and, and create an open source project that you can quickly go and, and take a look at, you know, how do you protect your own AI of your organization? 
The second is explainability. It's okay to make a decision, right? Um, being able to say that, hey, you have been denied uh, insurance court, but not give the reason, right? The chances that the person may come back to you is slim if you if you blanket reject. But the other hand, you know, providing the appropriate explainability will help quite a bit in, in trusting that um, AI and trusting that brand and trusting that organization. And it's okay, even if it's, you know, excessive to a certain extent, it's like um, eating a bag of chips. It's okay to eat a bag of chips as long as you know, understand the nutritional value over there and, and, and figure out, you know, how many bags of chip can you can, you can have for that day, right? And, and that's what explainability is. And we've created a similar sort of a toolkit that we put it in the open source for you to go and experiment so that you can understand how your AI is um, measures against explainability and then provides um, help with defining that explainability for your models. The third one is my favorite, which is attackers are using AI to defeat AI. You've seen that, right? Being able to introduce that distortion to the video, being able to look at some of the blind spots, being able to ask that, you know, questions through APIs. How do you detect that? And, and potentially um, ensure that you're safeguarded for that. That's what adversarial robustness is. We created a toolkit called um, Adversarial Robustness Toolkit, which is something that we released at um, RSA. Again, an open source toolkit, which will first and foremost, think about it as scans your AI and, and think about it as very similar to scanning your application, but scanning your AI model and tells you if something is, is good, bad, and, and be able to uh, tell you how susceptibility is for a potential attack. And then gives you an appropriate mechanisms to go defend against that with some models. So these are some um, examples. Um, like I said, this is my favorite one. So of course it gets a, 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 a slide by itself. Um, you know, as you are um, developing AI, whether you're a security um, individual or you're, you're developing AI models for transforming your business. I mean, take a look at these trusted AI toolkits. Um, these three, we call them as trusted AI, um, these toolkits, and, and whether you're using TensorFlow or Keras or you know, some of the uh, well-known um, uh, toolkits or, or tools, um, this toolkits work with the open source uh, mechanism so that it can go and um, perform that attack. Of course, within, within your own environment and then tell you if something is bad so that you can go and provide a mechanism to defend against that. So with that, um, I do wanna bring this to a, a, a quick wrap up. Um, don't see any specific questions on the chat. So AI is, is very powerful. Um, and one of the questions that I continuously get is, is it going to replace you know, humans? Of course it's not, right? It enables humans to do better. AI provides speed and accuracy. Humans bringing ingenuity and creativity. The combination is awesome. That's a way to think about it. It helps humans respond faster, create these associations that are difficult to um, see through uh, naked eye or, or just look through the screens, reduces fatigue, um, helps you go home at a decent time. It can help you speed up your investigation, right? Um, it can find new attacks that are not previously known, as well as what we've seen at the end, it can help provide some level of counteraction for adversarial attacks. So we try to summarize that, those three use cases by saying that AI helps you with proactive speed, 
um, proactive protection, improving the accuracy of detection so that you're focused on the right alerts to spend your time on, as well as accelerate the response. You know, remember we talked about the 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 average time for detecting an attack is almost 220 days and responding is another 80 days brings that 300 days to a much smaller number so that the attack hopefully is, is smaller or the impact is smaller and the other part is to be also looking at um, how the attackers use ai and defend against that with that um you know i the slides will be available um, for download. If you have any, any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and if you have any questions at the moment, you know, feel chime in. Okay, if there's no questions, um, I will try to do a very small demo with a view to hopefully take away something from here. So we'll try to keep it about five, six minutes. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a dashboard of our open platform for XDR, which was recently released um, last week. And typically it's open platform. So um, as an organization, you may have a number of different, different tools and products that you've invested in, right? Things like IBM products and non-IBM products like Amazon and Azure, Sentinel or Curator or Guardian, or even, you know, Splunk and Palo Alto, this number could go on, right? Um, this specific system is connected to a few data sources, but it's easily, um, you can easily connect to a new data source using an open source uh, mechanism and, and all of these, adapters are contributed to something called stick shifter which is part of open cyber security alliance you can also bring in assets which is where remember we're talking about the 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 context of your organization right um the active directory who has access to what what is the value of these assets those are important to be able to pinpoint the appropriate um severity of a specific attack you can also connect to a number of different threat intelligence sources. You may have your own, you may have threat intelligence from IBM or non-IBM sources. All of those have to come together so that we are able to go and, and do the best in terms of how you are able to react to threats. So if you look at you know, XDR, um, we use AI right from the get-go. We, we have this customized dashboard um, and depending upon you know, who is a persona, you can create appropriate dashboard. If you're a threat, if you're focused on threat intelligence, you know, this is the dashboard focused on threat intelligence, which is curating the specific intelligence information for your organization, for your geo. If you are a, a, you know, somebody looking at the overall posture of your organization, you're looking at you know, trend analysis and, and being able to find um, some of the specific things that you should be focused on using, um, you know, uh, anomaly detections and risk analytics. And if you are somebody looking at purely risk 
as a CISO that wants to communicate to the board, they can use risk as a mechanism to say how good or bad an organization is, and the same risk can be used to go and drive the priorities for the organization. All of this has AI. Now, if you're a SOC analyst, you can quickly go and look at your task, right? Um, and in this case, this is a SOC analyst who is coming in and, and they have a, um, a, an alert, an alert coming from Splunk saying, hey, there may be a potential personal information loss over here. Please go investigate it, right? As you click on that, AI comes into picture to go and you know look at the playbooks. At the top right, you see that. It's a, it's a sort of sequential steps that are pulled together to create sort of tasks for that specific type of attack, right? Even though it may or may not be, um, we don't know if it's severe or not severe, right? And the first thing it's saying is go and take a look at the investigator, which is an automatic way of doing threat investigation. The analyst has not done anything. We're using machine learning as a way to go and determine that, hey, this attack is low severity. It's coming from a system called Dan's PC. It's going to a number of different systems. It is mapped to an existing MITRE attack framework. So you can see how the attack is progressing. It has constructed an attack graph on how the attack has gone from uh, potentially in a Dan's laptop to a bunch of internal system. And this is what is causing some suspicious activity, right? It's going to an external system. You can, you can look at the detail of that external system, right? 10.10.956 seems suspicious. You can get the raw data. You can look at some of the Sigma rules from the open source. So as the rules evolve, you can improve the accuracy of the detection, et cetera. You can look at the details of this and you may want to say, hey, I want to explore more on that, right? Um, this is where you are able to go and quickly connect to all the different data sources that you saw, right? It's looking at all the data sources that's connected and came back with 2000 results. That's quite a lot, right? You can turn on analytics over here to go and figure out how do you now start investigating that, that 2000. Right, or use some simple search filters. Like, you know, we talked about potential PII information, right? So because it is PII, I looked at credit card and you're able to do a quick search across all of these different sources. You know, you're looking at EDR, you're looking at Palo Alto, Splunk, without necessarily pulling all of that data, we're using edge analytics over here, right? to be able to come back with 18 out of this 2000 and all of these 18 are organized in a manner that is consistent, whether it's Guardian, whether it is um, different product coming out so that you can go and then go and say, this is, this is a something to worry about or not, right? And in this case, you know, it, it is, it is a benign, um, uh, attack or uh, no credit card data was lost. So we can we can quickly go back to the case. And you can see the steps again. If you, if you recall the playbook, um, the playbook is executed, all the steps are coming in. You can go and say, hey, I have, I've seen this. There's nothing over here. 20% of the task is completed. You can go down each one of these, or in some cases, you can automate the response. The cool thing is, you know, if you look at the um, all the artifacts behind the scene, what is happening is all the information associated with attack is brought into one place, right? Whether it's Splunk or Guardian, and you can and 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 if you find anything specific, like a malware in this case, it's looking at the threat intelligence using machine learning as a way to go and figure out if it is relevant to you or not relevant to you, right? Um, not just giving information, but it's also telling you whether it's related cases. Have we seen this in the past? Have we seen this um, in other cases? Based on that, you can make a better determination of um, if you should pay attention to this or close this case.
I think I want to end this um, demo quickly. I just want to show you how different aspects of AI come in improving the accuracy of detection, increasing the speed of investigation that you saw that everything was available for the analyst in one place, regardless of which product it came from, using AI to go and pinpoint the information and then using machine learning as a way to automate some of the responses. Hope you like this demo for a quick uh, value of how AI is used. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. If not, um, thank you so much for your time in attending this session today.